All right, everyone, we are going to start the last session of the day and of the workshop. Really excited that we have Barbara Engelhart kicking things off. She's going to be telling us about her awesome work uh, designing experiments for Atlas Building. Barbara, take it away. Thanks. Uh First of all, thanks for the uh, invitation and organization, and I'm really glad to see everyone today. Um, okay, this is actually sort of the first, can you guys hear me? No? Okay, uh, this is sort of the first uh, talk I'm gonna give on uh, this work, but uh, I actually gave a talk at this uh, conference last year, and uh, it was on the sort of lead up to this work, so hopefully there's a, a full story emerging here. Um, so um, last year, I talked a little bit about uh, an approach we had to uh, build atlases, uh, and I'll tell you exactly what I mean by an atlas in a minute, but the idea is you take uh, a handful of uh, 2D images uh, from pretty much any technology you care to think about, uh, and you build an atlas. You build a 3D reconstruction of that space. This, this is a, a breast tumor sample, three different, uh, well, this is three, but we actually use four. Uh, and then this is the actual breast tumor itself, where I've colored the expression levels of a specific gene uh, within, uh, within that 3D space that we've imputed using our approach. I'm going to go through that approach really briefly, and then I'm going to tell you uh, a method that we came up with to actually tell you where to cut, what samples would be uh, optimal uh, in, in the uh, uh, sense I'll tell you about uh, for actually building these 3D atlases. Oops. Okay, so the model that actually was just published uh, last week um, uh, is uh, called uh, Gaussian process spatial uh, analysis. So uh, the idea is that uh, we have a two layer model. It's two layers of a Gaussian process and we use it to build a common coordinate framework using uh, a handful of 2D uh, spatial images. So for example, we'll have uh, SlideSeq V2 or Murfish or Mibi or whatever your uh, approach of choice is. Uh, they're all uh, from approximately the same tissue. We can map them all down to the same coordinate sp uh, space uh, system. So this is our shared coordinate system. And then in each point in that shared coordinate system, we can define what gene expression looks like or protein expression looks like at each point, okay? So that means that we can, uh, for any point in this shared latent space and this sort of scaffold of what this tumor or this uh, organ looks like, we can describe what gene expression looks like or protein expression looks like at that point using this Gaussian process. That was the easy version of it. The harder version that actually looks like this. So for every single uh, sample that we have, we actually take all of the 2D coordinates and we warp them uh, just slightly, but we warp them. You'll see these are non-linear. You can see a lot of uh, different directions. We're warping these points um, and uh, they're also local, right? We don't uh, make big warps. Um, so those were both uh, requirements of, uh, of this uh, layer of the model. This is our Gaussian process. This common coordinate system then can be any dimension you want, two dimensions, three dimensions, um, and we're going to warp each of these points then to the points on this common coordinate system, which again doesn't exist. We can put landmarks in if we want. If we have a common coordinate system for a particular organ, we can put it there too. Um, but also we can just pretend it's completely latent, non-existent, and we can infer this entire common coordinate system uh, in our model. And then finally, um, the, the last Gaussian process takes each point in this common coordinate system and again maps it to whatever dimension of features we want, whether it's gene expression, protein expression, pixel values, colors, whatever we want, um, we can map it. And we can do attack, uh, attack seek uh, data as well, whatever, whatever you'd like there. So uh, the sort of uh, crowning example of this method was uh, actually based on spatial transcriptomics with a capital S and capital T from the stall tape paper in 2016. Uh, so these are four slices, parallel slices uh, of a breast cancer biopsy, a single breast cancer biopsy. And uh, we did the obvious thing first, which is we align those four samples to a 2D space. Uh, so this is actually what view one and view two, two of the samples look like warped into the space. And this is actually what that reference space looks like. So if we were to actually pull out that latent common coordinate system, this is what the space looks like, where we've actually layered on top of it view one and view two, and also colored based on a specific uh, gene expression level in that space. So that's nice, but it actually doesn't get us to the atlas that I was talking about. So the atlas looks like this. We fantasized a Z direction, right? We knew exactly what order those four slices were put in, and we just essentially built a C, built in a Z direction, right? We said uh, this first slice is at Z zero, one, two, and three. Uh, sounds a little bit bizarre, but it actually worked. And then we just aligned it. 
And um, the alignment ended up warping each of the four slices like this. So here's X versus Z, you can see the warps, and then Y versus Z, again, you can see the warps. So the warps, it definitely warped in, in Z space for sure, um, but uh, uh, you can see that uh, in general, the order was maintained. So that ended us giving a, a, what you saw before, which is this uh, three-dimensional description of this breast tumor. Um, and we're currently in the process of actually annotating this uh, and actually showing you the regions of different regions of this breast tumor, outlining the, the tumor itself, describing uh, different uh, regions of uh, immune cell activity and other things like that. It's a little bit hard with spatial transcriptomics. It turned out this is a fairly old technology and we're looking for other slices like that we can do uh, uh, this method on, but we actually have a ton right now. And we're actually doing on, for example, a, a human retina at, at this point, which has multiple slices as well. Um, so given that we have this model, um, what can we do on top of it? So we really want to make Atlas building something that is easy to do. So given you have a tumor, given you have a mouse brain, given you have something very specific that may or may not have a common coordinate system, we wanted to make it easy for any lab to do this. And moreover, we wanted to make it easy for any lab to do this on a budget. Um, so what we first did, and this paper was recently um, accepted, um, so it'll be out soon, but it's on archive so you can see it, or yeah, archive. Uh, we built an experimental design method. Um, and in particular, it was motivated first by Atlas building, but also by boundary finding. So if you're a, a pathologist and you see uh, like an H&E stain, let's say, uh, and you'd be really interested in understanding what the boundaries of that tumor are, one thing you can do is cut, uh, uh, make multiple 2D cuts into that system to try and figure out where the boundary of that tumor is in order to be able to resect it and other things you need to do. Um, so those were our two motivating examples for this. So to give you an idea of actually how you build an atlas, um, here's an example of simulated tissue. So this isn't real, but you can imagine. Um, you take a slice. Uh, here are the observations from this slice. And I'm imagining it in 1D, 2D, but this is really 2D, 3D. Um, when you take a slice of an of a actual sample, it creates two fragments, right? You split the sample. You're not allowed to have a slice then that uh, goes through those two fragments, right? It has to be on one side or the other. Um, we can also build a set of candidate slices, right? Um, we can um, just go over those slices and figure out how much information about the full tumor each of those slices adds. Uh, we can actually just take the first optimal slice and see where the uh, fragments are in a greedy way. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you actually how we do this in math, um, <laughs> briefly for those of you who don't care. Um, so our goal again is to select the next sample, given the samples that we already have, that is most predictive of Y, where Y is gonna be our atlas. Uh, and in this case, our atlas is defined by the model that I showed you before, by this two layer Gaussian process, and it has parameters theta. So just to be very clear, uh, X is gonna be our set of slices, Y is our atlas, um, and our model is gonna be this GPSA model that I just told you about. Here, um, capital H uh, of this probability is gonna be entropy. Um, and we want to minimize entropy. Entropy is a measure of uncertainty. So we wanna be as certain about our atlas in terms of how well it represents uh, the actual uh, tumor, the actual organ uh, as possible. We wanna reduce entropy. So uh, the way that we actually do this is using something called Bayesian Optimal Experimental Design. Um, and the metric that we use to choose the next uh, slice is something called the expected information gain or the EIG. And the idea is basically if you have, um, if you have uh, your, your uh, X, your slices and your Y, your model, we would like to actually choose the slice and add it to X such that uh, this entropy, the expected entropy, I should say, decreases maximally by adding that slice, okay? So that was our goal. And it turns out if you do this in a greedy way, you can have sequential experimental design. You can sequentially choose the best slice. Um, I'll say a few things about this. In practice, uh, we use variational inference uh, to estimate the predictive distribution. So in other words, these predictive distributions here, the probability of the atlas given our model and given the new slice um, is estimated in an, in an approximate way. Um, and the second thing is there are a lot of slices we could choose from. I'll say that we end up gridding the space. So we have a lot of different angles. We have a lot of different possible slices and we just select a hundred, a thousand of them uh, given a tissue and choose among those thousand that we choose. And I'll say one more thing that I think comes up a lot, uh, and it came up a lot in our discussion with the reviewers, we explicitly modeled the destructive nature of a slice on the original sample. In other words, like I showed you in the previous slide, 
uh, if you actually slice a, uh, a slice a sample, then you cannot have a slice that goes through those two uh, halves now, those two fragments. You have to have a slice on either one of the sides. So that's a, a very uh, important part of this. Um, so uh, to test how our uh, model worked, we first looked at the problem of uh, designing an atlas. And we didn't really have any ground truth. Um, so the closest thing to ground truth we actually have, I think, is probably the Allen Brain Atlas. There are other ones, but the Allen Brain one is incredibly detailed uh, and had exactly what we needed. So here actually is sort of a, an entire description of the Allen Brain Atlas. Uh, what we did was we took a slice, uh, you know, a, 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 a theoretical slice from this Allen Brain Atlas and came up with what this probably looked like in gene expression space. So here we're using, I think, some version of uh, you know, approximately MRFish uh, type data uh, to be able to um, uh, analyze this space. Um, so here's what we think we would get if we uh, ran MRFish on this particular slice. Uh, and we iterated this a number of times, uh, trying to recreate the atlas using our GPSA method at each iteration to be able to get that predictive distribution. Um, and at the end of the day, we ended up running it for about 15 iterations. So we took 15 different slices, acknowledging again, after every slice that we were splitting the, the brains in half or the single brain in half. Uh, and you can see that our method uh, comes uh, pretty much as close to uh, the full atlas, so optimal. Uh, fairly quick. I would say sort of around here, we've kind of plateaued out. So at about 10 iterations, we essentially have uh, uh, reconstructed the atlas as well as uh, these types of approaches can do. Um, we actually tried it with no fragmenting. In other words, we did allow our next slices to overlap the original slice. This actually gave a slightly worse performance, interestingly. And the way I think I'm explaining it to myself is that when you overlap uh, the slice that you just took, you're actually uh, capturing redundant information. So I think it is interesting that um, uh, uh, allowing fragmenting actually gives you better, uh, better uh, performance. Um, and then we also tried the serial approach, which is actually we just had an expert come in and tell us what they would slice for the next uh, for the next approach. Um, so that uh, that also did not do very well. Interesting, although it, it really did a good job on this this fifth one, it turns out. Um, so that was nice. Uh, I also said that we were really interested in creating uh, bounding tumors or bounding tumors as well from this approach. So you can imagine, you know, if this is your sample, you'd like to figure out uh, how to bound this tumor and you can see approximately where it is in this space. Uh, a lot of these slices here are suboptimal, right? They go right through the tumor. Uh, you're only going to be able to bound right at the boundary uh, of each of these slices. So you'd like to have a different approach. Um, so again, we, uh, we were interested in, in trying this out. Uh, we can see that the serial approach, which is here, which again, does a really good job at about the sixth iteration versus our approach, which ends up doing a really good job essentially by the fourth iteration of, of slicing. Um, so uh, long story short, if you look at the, the overlapping performance, we do as well as the serial method, basically by try number four. Um, so uh, with many, many fewer, with half the number of slices, we can bound uh, this, um, uh, this tumor um, as well as uh, the serial method. Um, so I've told you about uh, how we actually uh, uh, do this in practice, but uh, ultimately when you are an on the ground experimenter and you want to actually do this approach, you're gonna be confronted by the realities of research. So in particular, and I'll, I'll say we actually uh, presented this at a workshop last December. So it's actually kind of older work now, but uh, we need to get it out. My, my uh, uh, first, uh, uh, my, the, the first author here is actually, he graduated and went to a hedge fund. So he's a little disincentivized from finishing this work. But, um, but the idea again, is that we, we have uh, some region, maybe it's a tumor, maybe it's a brain, and we'd really like to understand what the next uh, observation is. Um, but the reality is again, in practice, we can choose from a number of different approaches. We can do an H and E stain, we can do Murfish, we can do MIBI, we can do a number of different things at different fidelities um, at different costs. And so what we did was we basically took this idea that we had about uh, using EIG in, in uh, Bayesian optimal experimental design, and we uh, added to that the idea of a budget and a fidelity. Um, and it sounds like a fairly straightforward thing to do, but actually it took a bit of cleverness on the part of uh, Andy and Diana, the two lead authors on this, uh, because you really have to take into account, um, again, budget, obviously, there's a hard constraint of how much money you can spend, but also the fidelity turned out to be really interesting. So uh, you can take a low fidelity uh, uh, sample 
when you're very sure about what's going to happen there. But the question is, how does that influence information gain? So there's this really interesting trade-off that had to be played out in math. And, and I think they did a really wonderful job of this. Um, and so the idea is now we can actually, oh, the code that we actually released on this actually allows you to specify a budget and a set of technologies too. Um, so uh, so uh, hopefully we're sort of uh, democratizing the ability to put together an atlas, uh, given your, your constraints and resources. So um, at a very high level, I'll tell you that we're designing specific atlases. Um, I, I would like to share with you all of the different models. One of, one of them is the retina, but we have a bunch of other organs that I think I'm not allowed to say out loud yet. Um, we're also interested, like I said, in building atlases on a budget and labeling them. Um, so given, again, constraints, we'd like to really think about how we can use multiple technologies, uh, multiple data modalities uh, to get a clearer picture of an atlas and maybe even improve uh, the, the, the reconstruction itself, given that we're using multiple technologies. We'd also like to label them. So I haven't told you about this, but another uh, piece of work from my lab is actually uh, annotating, uh, uh, do, doing dimension reduction to be able to annotate uh, spatially these uh, three-dimensional spaces. Um, and then finally thinking about uh, at a very high level, uh, well, not at a very high level, at a very model-based level, uh, how to incorporate different uh, samples and different atlases using different technologies. So as we know, there's going to be a lot of information about specific tumors. We now have uh, spatial attack seek uh, methods that are being deployed all over the place. Um, and we'd really like to understand how these different modalities can work together uh, to create a better vision of the, uh, of the organ or the tumor itself. Um, so with that, I will acknowledge my amazing group. This is a fairly old photo now. It's a year old. Um, and uh, uh, thank you all for your attention. Really awesome. Thanks, Barbara. Um, question from online. Uh, anyone else who has questions, please walk up to the mic. Uh, given that there's it's obviously a much longer feedback loop for generating data rather than generating the models. Yes. Um, how, how was that process of working with experimental people? Um, how do you envision it could work moving forward when you're actually using this to decide what experiment to do next? And what are some of the like challenges and opportunities there? That's a great question. So I'll say one thing that I didn't say, which is we also have what's called a batch uh, method or mini batch method. So whereas I tell you that we're, we're only doing a single slice, the reality is exactly like this question is asking. If you're working with an experimental uh, uh, biologists, they would like to have multiple slices. They don't want to just walk in and, and do one slice and then do the next one, you know, four weeks later, right? They want to have like four slices they can just go off and do and then do the next round. We actually built that into this method as well. Um, it actually, with the, with the multi-fidelity version of it, we can actually also think about different technologies for these four different slices as well. If we have the ability to non-destructively uh, act with a, a single slice, like do an H&E stain and something else, we also take that into account as well. Um, so, uh, but you're absolutely right. We are aware that there's a really slow cycle on this. Um, I mean, the good news about the slow cycle is that we can kind of be slow. We can, we can do uh, very, uh, uh, very detailed modeling of the system um, because it takes, you know, let's say five days to run these things on very, uh, very specific information if we choose to, if we don't uh, make it a low fidelity uh, inference. Um, but um, you're right, it, it, it just, uh, the cycle takes a long time. I, I don't think, I mean, I think it's just the reality of experimental design uh, for, uh, for, for actual biology and, and biological experiments. So I don't know, I, I'm, I'm happy with it. <laughs> Great. How do you see the atlases that you build as a result of this technique feeding into like future work uh, for optimization or modeling or machine learning or those types of things? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of flip the question around, which is I think that um, the idea of doing experimental design, um, it's something we know how to do really, really well, whether we use bandits, whether we use uh, these Bayesian uh, optimization approaches, whether we use Gaussian processes, this is kind of something that we do really, really well uh, in machine learning. And um, I'm kind of hoping that actually the sort of uh, relationship between experimental biologists and um, uh, expertise there and these uh, machine learning methods to kind of help prioritize next experiments uh, would be uh, 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 better exploited, I guess, because um, hopefully we will be able to save you some time as we uh, try to show here with the boundary finding stuff. And, uh, you know, in return, you can tell us what these things are getting wrong, right? And, and we can make them better. So um, I, I think it's a, I think it would be a nice relationship to uh, uh, design and explore moving forward, uh, really developing these experimental design methods in collaboration with biologists.
Yeah. Great. Uh, what does your method tell you uh, about the relative benefits of different spatial technologies? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I, uh, we, we didn't explore that as much as we should in this workshop paper. That's what's kind of left to do. Uh, but it's a great question. I mean, um, first of all, I'll say that we haven't um, given the model that we have, we have not worked too hard on uh, thinking about the relationship between the different modalities. So if I have an H&E stain and a gene expression, you know, with, with a, 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 a Murfish or something like that, it would be really nice to be able to say, well, actually the H&E stain can explain some of the Murfish data and the Murfish data can explain some of the, uh, the H&E stain, uh, but that's not what we've done yet. Um, so I think uh, if we were to extend that model and any of these models, actually, it would be to really think carefully about how those two different uh, or multiple data modalities play off of each other, right? What can you infer from one and the other? Right now, we just sort of assume that there's some covariation, it exists, but we're just going to model them all together jointly as opposed to playing off each other. So there have been a number of papers, including from my group, about if you have H and E stains, you have gene expression data, even spatial gene expression data, what uh, can you infer gene expression from H and E and vice versa? Um, there was also one from Rege uh, Aviv Regev's lab a couple of months ago. And um, these are really amazing models, and I think they should be incorporated into methods like this. So I'll, I'll say what we don't have instead of what we have. Yeah. <laughs> What are the opportunities for combining this type of uh, modeling approach with more uh, machine learning driven approaches to explain the data once you have it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely critical. So like I said, my group has a method to uh, do some annotation on 2D and 3D uh, models of, of gene expression data and protein expression data. But um, uh, but beyond that, I think it's uh, it's hard. I mean, you can use one of a million different kinds of uh, dimension reduction methods. I think those are really the best thing to do right now or call in an expert uh, or, you know, do the uh, Gary Nolan approach, which I think is uh, very elegant and beautiful and think about specific cells and their interactions and, and uh, you know, immune uh, environments and things like that, immune cell environments uh, within tumors. Um, so I think there's a ton of things to do downstream. I think really the, the bottleneck there is literally just running, running the methods on these 3D atlases. Uh, but I think there should be a huge pipeline of, of analysis after they're built. Yeah. Um, how, okay, I'm going to rephrase this to be slightly more polite. Um, given that uh, the people who own the data often are protective uh, about taking slices through it, uh, especially maybe from an algorithm that uh, came up with the proposed plan. Have you implemented this and how receptive have people been to uh, taking those suggestions of what data to collect next? Yeah, that's great. So um, uh, I ha I'm lucky to have a bunch of really amazing collaborators. So for example, I, this is one I can share with you. Um, Kate Pena at uh, uh, Princeton, uh, actually to, to write this paper, this was amazing to me. Andy like rolled into her lab where she's dissecting mouse brains. And he was like, so tell me exactly how you do this mouse brain dissection. And he watched the, the grad student, you know, like actually take all the dissections and learned about how that was done. And it, it, I mean, I, it was really cool that, you know, we had such a close collaboration that he could actually do that. So um, uh, I'll, I'll be very clear that like a lot of labs do not share their data, but a ton of labs do as well. So, um, you know, I tend to <laughs> focus on those labs, but I mean, more than that too, there's a lot of uh, this information publicly. So the breast cancer uh, data set that I told you about, the, the four slices from ST is publicly available. Uh, this retina project uh, that I mentioned too, um, all these retina slices are available uh, publicly. So actually we've been finding a lot of data publicly and a lot of data with amazing collaborators that we've been working with. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, join me in thanking Barbara for a really great talk. Next up, we have Emma Lundberg, um, who will be telling us about the spatial proteome biology from subcellular to tissue level. Emma. Hi, everyone. I actually renamed my talk <laughs> but from subcellular spatial mapping to modeling of the proteome. I thought we heard so much about tissues already, so I, I'd focus mainly on the, the subcellular aspect here. So thanks for inviting me. It's been a really great meeting so far. And just as a little starter, I want to point out that I'm one of the co-directors of the Human Protein Atlas Project. So a lot of the images that I will show you today are from the Human Protein Atlas project. They're generated there and they're also available there in case you wanna use it. So what we have at hand that is nice that we base a lot of our work on is the in-house 
generated resource of antibodies that targets the majority of all human proteins uh, and also all the images that we've generated. Uh, and, and the protein atlas has about over two, 2 million users per year, although we know that most people don't actually look at the images. So there's still a lot of information in this resource that can be harvested if you know how to capture information from images. Uh, and most importantly, the, the key data in the Protein Atlas is images. So there's only over 20 million images in here. So it's actually a really good resource for building machine learning applications. And today I'm mainly going to focus on the leftmost side here, the subcellular mapping of, of the human proteome. And this is something we've been doing for a long time in, in our lab. And we want to be able to see where proteins are inside of the cell because it gives us good clues about a protein's function. If it's in the mitochondria, it might be involved in energy production and so on. So we built this pipeline where we used oil, use oil immersion confocal microscopy to localize proteins, and we use some reference markers. So this is just an example cell. We have DOPI for the nucleus. We have a marker for microtubules. We have a marker for the endoplasmic reticulum, so a marker for membranous structure. So these are kind of our reference markers that outlines the cell, will be important for later computational uh, part of my talk. And on top of this, we localize the human proteins one at a time. This is CD44. We can see that it's on the surface of this cell. Let's see, oh, I can't point, but you, you can see that it's on the surface of that cell. So this is kind of what we've been doing for a long time and generating many images like this for the majority of all intracellular proteins. And we've done this for, nope, my clicker stopped working. Okay, thank you. So we've done this for a major many, we have a panel of 60 different cell lines. So it's a, it's a very big data set. It has great advantages, but it ha also has a lot of limitations. So I'll take you to that. But now I wanna highlight some of the most interesting findings that we found here. Uh, and I think this image illustrates it very well. So these are, this is a cultivated cell line and these cells are more or less genetically transcriptionally identical. They're non-synchronized those for the cell cycle. But as you can see, the cells look quite different. So we've stained one protein here. It's enolase one, it's an enzyme, and it's performing its canonical function in the cytoplasm. And in some cells, you can see it in the cytoplasm. In other cells, you see that this protein is in the nucleus where it actually binds to DNA and has a completely different function. And in other cells, it's also on the cell surface where it's, it's a plasminogen receptor. So these cells that are kind of seemingly identical have very different functional capacities in the way driven by how they change the abundance of this protein and also how they change the location of this protein. So I would argue that, well, we can never really understand or model or predict cell behavior unless we take spatial information into account. And I guess at this meeting, I don't have to argue for that, that uh, opinion because I hope most of you will agree. So we've been mining our image collection to find proteins that show signs of spatial heterogeneity or up and down regulation and multi-localization and so on. Because uh, multi-localizing proteins are, have the potential of performing multiple functions in the cell. So basically one gene give rise to one protein that is localized to two places and give rise to two functions or pleiotropic effects as they're often called uh, when you can't explain them. <laughs> uh, so what we've been able to find is that 51% of all human proteins localized to multiple compartments where they potentially give rise to pleiotropic effects. And this has been also supported by others in other species as well after we published this. And we've been able to show that 21% of proteins show spatiotemporal dynamics. So over time, they will change and, and translocate between compartments or go up and down in levels. So it's quite extensive if you think of it. It's really a lot of spatiotemporal heterogeneity going on in the cells. So we were very intrigued by this and wanted to figure it out. And we thought that the most dominant dynamic process that we have going on in these cultivated cells would be the cell cycle because they're not synchronized. So this is a study that we did a couple of years back where we decided to use a Fuchi cell line, so the U2S Fuchi cell line. So the cells express a red and a green fluorescent marker, which means that you can follow the cell cycle trajectory over interface and you can build this linear representation of cell cycle pseudotime. So basically, if you look to the, at the plots to the left, right, you're right, uh, you can see this is kind of what we wanted to do. We wanted to map RNA expression by single cell sequencing and protein expression by antibody staining uh, onto the cell cycle pseudotime. And if the variations that we observe would be explained by the cell cycle, we would expect some kind of curve to appear. If it would be independent, we would expect a flat line. Do you follow? Yeah, good. Uh, so this is just uh, 
some uh, assay controls. We use some well-known cell cycle proteins, some proteins that we know that vary independently of the cell cycle, and also, of course, some negative uh, non-variable controls. So you can see that it works. We get this profile. We get this in the middle high variability, but no profile, and so on. So then we ran this rather massive study. And of course, we found a lot of the known cell cycle proteins, like BUB1B and cyclin E1, uh, where you can see protein levels changing over time and RNA levels changing over time. So the x-axis here is ours. And it, it's kind of a, a noisy data, Fuji cells are noisy, but we can see temporal profiles. And we know that these genes are regulated at the transcript level. But then we also found a lot of proteins. Oh, sorry. I'm, there's a slide missing there. I'm so sorry, the most important slide. Uh, <laughs> so sorry. Uh, Actually, if I if I go back, oh, so sorry for this. A lot of the new proteins that we found are actually temporally regulated at the protein level, but flat at the RNA level. This is really the key slide. So in total in this study, we found 300 new cell cycle proteins that are mainly stably expressed at the RNA level, but cycle at the protein level or translocate. So it means that they're mainly regulated post-translationally. We could also see that the average temporal delay between the peak of RNA and the peak of protein expression is about 8.6 hours. So it's quite long. If you want to think about doing multi-omics integration, you might want to take that into consideration. But it's also very similar to what has been observed for the circadian rhythm and this, the cell cycle at 25 hours. So it might make sense. And of course, many proteins of potential interest, such as markers for cell proliferation as well. So sorry for dropping that slide, but hopefully you understand the, the, the gist of it. Uh, but what was most interesting uh, still to me with this study is that our assumption that most of these variable proteins would be explained by the cell cycle was wrong. Only one third could be explained by the cell cycle. So two thirds vary depending on something else, signaling, circadian rhythm, we don't know. But then we noticed a great enrichment for metabolic enzymes. So I told you 21% of all human proteins show spatiotemporal dynamics. And if we look at human enzymes only, this number is 40%. And we see it across many different types of metabolism. So let me show you another example. This is typically what it looks like. It might not look that impressive at first, but HMGCS1 is an enzyme involved in cholesterol biosynthesis, and it, it's performing that function in the cytosol. We can also see that it's in the nucleus. And we can also see that it goes up and down in levels. Uh, about the same magnitude as your average cell cycle protein, which is a pretty strong cellular effect. So here, of course, we were intrigued, but also a bit concerned. Antibodies might be cross-reactive, and if they're cross-reactive, they most often stick to the nucleus because it's charged and so on. So let's, we wanted to validate this with another method. So we teamed up with uh, Manu Leonetti at the Transcycle Biohub in San Francisco and performed biallelic GFP tagging of this enzyme and 80 other enzymes in hex cells. And then we took a single cell and let that cell divide into, divide a couple of times so that we would get a clone, a clonal expansion and see could that single cell, would we still see the same variability? And this is the, the results that we got. So it kind of, it proves that indeed a single cell has the capacity to reproduce all these different functional phenotypes of this enzyme. And that was the case for most of the enzymes that we tested. Uh, and this is where we started to get stuck in this, in this work. So, um, and this leads me to the multiplexed imaging. This is just one enzyme. We're talking about thousands of enzymes. If you want to study all of them and how this heterogeneity is interconnected, how can we possibly do that? Well, multiplexed imaging is great. This is some, an image that we generated in the lab from a, a lungs of a human fetus, but we can only do, we mainly use the phenocyte for the codex technology, but we can only do 30, 40 markers like that. What if we want to look at thousands of enzymes? How, how do we do that? So we started to discuss this with a Professor Matthias Mann from the Max Planck Institute and worked with him to develop a technology called deep visual proteomics. So he was the lead author on, on this paper. And the idea here is that we can combine spatial phenotyping with deep proteomic profiling by mass spectrometry, basically. And now we are working on an extension of this, a deep visual proteomics 2, or whatever you want to call it, where we actually do highly multiplexed imaging up front. Because in this first paper, we just did regular immunofluorescence or H and E. So now we worked for a couple of years very hard to optimize a lot of things so that we'll be able to take archival tissue top left, and then do a highly multiplexed staining using the phenocyclocodex technology on membrane slides and still have high contrast. 
and while minimizing proteome loss during the cycles that you have there because what is often not discussed in these technologies is that you can have significant proteome loss during cyclic uh, washes and everything so we actually had to optimize quite a bit and then we do the image analysis and the clustering and everything and then we select which cells we're interested in and then we make sure those segmentations are good and we transfer those contours to the laser micro dissection instrument that will cut those cells and this is really the bottleneck of this technology cut cells and pool them so that we get because we can't really do single cell max mass spectrometry with any depth but if we really define cell types very well based on the multiplex imaging we can cut maybe 100 cells 200 cells and pool them and get deep proteomic measurements so this is kind of the the id and we've optimized a lot of different things but it, it seems to be working so <laughs> that's good so this is just an example we we wanted to work with pancreas it's a different difficult tissue it has high enzymatic content it's hard to work with rna extraction so we thought it was a good good example so we have this panel where we mainly focus on the different um well both endocrine and exocrine um cell populations and the microenvironments so for example here you can see an islet and you can see the different alpha beta cell markers and such in the islet so as one example in this project we're trying to define the proteome of all these cell types but as one example we can for example see these rare cells also that express markers of being both alpha cells and beta cells so they're doublets and we don't really know what they are in single cell sequencing studies you would just throw them out as doublets but we can really see that it, they are expressed in the same cell right but we don't know is it an alpha cell is it a beta cell uh, but here we can actually target those cells and cut them out and, and figure out what they are, hopefully. <laughs> we're not there yet, but we're still running the cutting. It actually, it's actually 68 days of cutting to do this project. So we're, we're, uh, it, it's not plug and play, but I ju I'm just going to show you some preliminary results. At least, at least it looks like we can get, without any significant proteome loss, we can detect more than 5,000 proteins from what is 300 cell contours, which corresponds to the volume of 100 single cells. And now with the newest version of the mass spectrometers, this can probably be cut in half or, or even more than that. So we're quite excited about this technology, even though it's not fast, we think that that proteomic depth can really add to the type of work that we've heard more about in, in this meeting. So we're quite excited about that. Another way to try to get to multiplex imaging might be through, through cell modeling because we have images of almost all human proteins. So there might be computational ways to, to aggregate that data as well. So this kind of takes me to the second part of my presentation. And here, this I'm sure you've seen this slide a million times, but it's just a good reminder. It's like, where are we now in terms of cell modeling? Well, the genome project revealed a list of parts. These are the genes that we have. The cell atlasing projects, in my opinion, including the protein atlas, have revealed cell type specific inventories of these parts. This is approximately how many transcripts are expressed in this cell types and in this cell type. But we still don't, don't know the assembly of the cells. So we don't know how all these proteins, for example, assemble into a cell. So this is kind of where I think modeling can really help. And we want to get to that structural assembly of the entire human cell. And we have images. And of course, the images show structural information about the cells. So we can use machine learning models to embed the information that we have in our images. So this is I'm not going to go into the details. There's two papers if you're, you're interested uh, in, in learning more about it or chat to us. But this is machine learning features extracted with a machine learning model from all images in the cell atlas of the human protein atlas. So basically, we can embed that information that tells us, informs us about the spatial distribution of a protein in a cell, global distribution of a protein in a cell, which is amazing because now we can start to integrate that information with other types of, of molecular measurements to build models of cells. So we were thinking about, the, as we've heard at this meeting before, the hierarchical nature of cells. Of course, we all know that cells are compartmentalized. We have, you know, proteins that form complexes that assemble into pathways and you find different pathways in different organelles or cross organelles and then you have cells in the end so if we really want to model function we have to model because function exerts at different scales right so we want to do multi-scale modeling so we were thinking that our images only provides resolution at the rightmost end of this slide whereas for example protein protein interaction data would maybe provide valuable information at the the other end of this scale so in a collaboration with Professor Trey Eidecker at UCSD, we thought we could use machine learning to, to model the multi-scale proteome architecture. So this was a kind of 
proof of concept pilot project, I would say, of the computational approach, but it was only 700 proteins, not any biological reasoning behind those proteins. Other than that, it was the proteins where we had overlapping PPI and image data. So we, we used, uh, it's hexels. So we used our images, embedded it with our machine learning model, and then we used protein protein action data, embedded it with a node to vec model. And then we had these basically vectors describing the, the local distribution of neighbors of a protein with the PPI data and the global distribution of a protein through the images. And then we concatenated those vectors and could calculate the pairwise distance between different proteins. And of course, now there's even better ways to do this joint embedding and everything, but that's what we did there. So we could measure the feature distance between different proteins, and then we could actually calibrate that to physical scale as well, as we often do in imaging. And then we could use those pairwise distances to do the kind of typical Eidecker type of, of hierarchical modeling and pan resolution community detection. So that we, in the end, end up with a map like this that we call music, multi-scale integrated cells. So you can think of it, it's, you can see it's the cell is at the top and then you have the nucleus and cytoplasm and then it goes into smaller and smaller compartments all the way into the bottom where you have like tight, tight interaction complexes. So you can think of this as kind of gene ontology cell component, but it, it's not man-made, it's data-driven and it goes all the way down to the small systems. So all the purple systems here were new. They were not represented in gene ontology. We had to spend a lot of time to validate this. Uh, but in, it turns out that most of the systems that we did look into in detail, we could validate. So it seems like a powerful approach to actually start to map the multiscale nature of cells. And we think that a lot of this power comes from that the model captures the pleiotropic effects of multilocalization from the images and kind of gives that dimension to the protein-protein interactions. So you can think of this way of modeling also, for example, if you're interested in RNA protein interactions and how they form phase separated assemblies and things like that, you can probably use a similar approach. But coming from the image domain, this is great, but I still think we lose a lot of information because images have information about morphology and states and things like that, that we don't have there. So uh, continuing from the, the talk we heard earlier this morning about generative AI, uh, maybe we can use generative AI. It allows us to go from text to image, right? And what if we could go from amino acid sequence or DNA sequence to a genotype to phenotype? So from amino acid sequence to image, for example, that, that would be very, very neat. So for example, it would allow us to maybe inspect which amino acids are important for a protein to localize to a specific compartment or, or anything like that. So we've been, this is still work in progress. And it's a collaboration with a former postdoc of mine that's now is running his own lab in Sweden, Wei Young. Young. Um, and we're using stable diffusion models that you already heard about. So this is kind of our approach. So to the left here, you have the autoencoder that we first use to take the image space into a compressed equivalent domain in the latent space so that it's more uh, efficient to compute on. And then we do all the computation in, in the, the stable diffusion model. And then we can also input conditions here. So we can input amino acid sequence. We can tell the model which cell line we want to generate images of. But also, as, as you heard this morning, it might be good to generate completely new images, but also those cells never existed for real. So what we can do is also to, for example, condition the image generation on the reference channels in our images and tell the model to generate an image of this protein on these reference channels, this, this image, because then at least we know that the cells existed and their morphology is real. Uh, so we can... For example, this was generated with a GAN model, but different model. We can generate synthetic images that look very photorealistic of different cell lines, as you can see here. We can generate images of different proteins that will show different localization. We cannot do this accurately from amino acid sequence to image alone at the moment. So now we're using some other tricks, um, but it's ongoing work, but at least it's showing promise. We're still working with a small model. So you can see that the resolution is not amazing. But most importantly, we're, we're working towards at the, as the first instance towards multiplexing all protein atlas images on top of each other. So that you, for example, here, we project that this is just synthetic images, but it's, it's showing the probability of how 16 different proteins from the protein atlas would be localized if they were in the same cell. So even though this is prediction, it's a starting point, we still think that this could be a very valuable way of doing top-down whole cell modeling and that you can kind of determine in which pixels, which proteins could be localized and then maybe connect that to bottom-up structural modeling or cryo-EM modeling or have the pixel service boundaries for, for other types of more functional modeling. 
And with that, my time is up and I want to thank the group. This is a photo of the group while we were still in Sweden, we recently moved here. So I should really update that photo, uh, but it's amazing to be here. And I'm very grateful to everyone that followed from Sweden and all the people that joined the lab here. And the work that I presented today has particularly been done by the people highlighted in red here. So thanks a lot. Happy to take any questions. Great. <clears throat> Anyone who has questions, please walk up to the mic. I'll start with some from the chat. How did you stain membrane slides uh, with codex and did it require extensive optimization? It required a lot of optimization and um, we are a little bit more sensitive to the signal to noise. We need slightly higher signal to noise and then, but, but it actually works pretty well. <laughs> there, there's some optimization to the protocols, but not, not that much. Uh, and the last picture is very impressive that you can do this. I mean, it's really cool. Uh, so it's a little off topic, but can can you can you also train your model to figure out whether an image is not real? I'm more thinking for the our community as scientists that people are not just taking advantage of this thing because there's likely people that will. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, you, of course, the, these models are built on this like <laughs> adversarial yeah. loss functions and things like that. But, but of course, you can, you, you can often tell it apart. On these models are often used for, for you know, cleaning up images and getting rid of noise and things like that. So there are, there are differences in, in, and you can detect that. But in general, I think it's an important ethics question that should be discussed when we have generative models and we can generate synthetic data what is real, what is not real, what's the framework, how do we work with this? So I think so far, it's it's not a problem. There are ways to sanity check it, just not in the images, but also other ways of doing it. Uh, particularly, I think in the like background, in the black space, there's a lot of, of features that you can tell it from. But I think that the, the, the community you, needs to you, discuss it. When you it. choose to release it to the public. Uh, uh, yeah, we have not done that yet. I think we will. Of course, you can add watermarks and things like that, but the people that want to exploit it can remove that. So yeah, no, yeah. no problem. But it, it's a good question, and we might introduce things that shows that it might be synthesized. We're discussing it. We're actually working mm -hmm. with a bioethicist about it. It's not, yeah. not our domain to, yeah. to really think about that, but we're hoping that she and they can help us do that. Right. But congratulations. It's very cool. Thank you. Uh, that was a very fascinating talk. Um, I'm wondering if you could kind of look into the future. You see this generative model and kind of integrating, you know, uh, the entire human and then organs and then cells. Do you imagine that this could potentially be used in the future as, uh, especially the generative modeling, as a way of of finding new biomarkers for potential diseases? So you put in, you know, you're looking at a lysosomal storage disease, put in that disease, and you say. Give me predicted uh, proteins or signatures that will help a pathologist, for example, determine what what disease you're looking at. Yeah, I, I mean, I I hope so. I'm a positive person. I hope so. So what yeah. we've been also submitted many grants on is is to do whole cell modeling as a first step towards that, right? Because yeah. already now, if you look at whole literature that describes whole cell modeling, it's often on minimal genomes on our, or, or on bacteria, mycoplasma, smaller organisms, and it's hard to scale. And I think this is where the AI comes in. Maybe we can scale it top down and, and connect it somehow. And that, of course, maybe can be applicable to the entire human as well. So I'm, I would say I'm pretty hopeful. And in, in this, in our domain from the genome to the cell, of course, being able to see, let's say that these amino acids seem to be, if we look where, where the model pays attention, and we would be able to say that for this nucleolar protein, the model really pays attention to these amino acids and then overlaying that with mutational databases, for example, being able to get better insights to why certain mutations might disrupt localization of proteins. And that's often the cause of a disease, right? So I think even at our tiny scale, it can be impactful. So I, I would hope it can be impactful to that extent as well, but I think that's way beyond my, my uh, expertise. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, I have to join in with uh, congratulations, just incredible work. Um, I, I also was so interested that you had a lot of proteins in the nucleus. Um, and and I'm, I also practice clinical pathology and, you know, we, we look at antibodies to, to define certain tumors, but they've got to have a certain way of a pattern. So some only stay in the nucleus, some only the cytoplasm, 
and we're very particular about that because this is what's been validated. Um, and a lot of the times when you see staining in the nucleus, I, I well, that's just sticky stuff in the nucleus, and that's we're going to ignore that. But you showed very clearly that that's not the case. So when when these antibodies stain in areas that you don't expect them to, uh, that, that that just gets thrown out half the time. It, it's it's uh, it's, it, it's yeah. very eye opening. Um, I want to ask you about the the. Um, the circadian rhythm, because I know that, uh, for example, inflammatory cells in sputum, um, we know that there's a circadian rhythm of which cells are in, in your induced sputum. Um, and I've never really thought about the staining in the cells. So how big a thing do you think that is? For example, I know that, you know, we, we look at predictive biomarkers in lung cancer and different cancers. Um, and so the tumors are taken out at certain times and we, you know, we they're always stamped like the tumor was ischemic time was 8, 10 a.m. or this one was 5 p.m. Do you think that that would be a big enough range of time that might change the expression of markers in, in, your, in your tissue? Yes, I think so. I think that, that, that's still a significant part of, of this, like the day, yeah. right? So I think so. And I think this might be under an underused dimension for us working with cultivated cells you have to synchronize them to get the circadian rhythm mm. but with tissues we do have that information often so i think it's it's uh it's definitely a, a domain that i would like to explore further well, in, in it would be some interesting because, for information for pathologists to say yeah. well this mark is not staining very strongly maybe it's the time of day the tissue is removed i don't know but yeah yeah don't but know i, I do to want to add sorry to, to your first comment i get that comment often people are like oh yeah i actually saw nuclear staining of this protein mm -hmm. we thought it was unspecific staining so mm -hmm. we just threw it out it, it's very very common and we see particularly a lot of the metabolic enzymes will go into the nucleus where we don't know what function they're doing. So I'm sure there's a lot of like imprinting or, or connectedness there that we don't mm -hmm. know of yet. So don't throw it away until you no, know if it's real or no. not. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions from the chat. Um, why did you decide to do mass spec as your downstream readout uh, instead of like flow sorting based on the IF phenotypes that you see from codex? Flow, so dissecting the tissue and then do flow sorting. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, basically, <laughs> I don't know. We just thought that it could be better with the, the laser macular dissection because we can also get extracellular parts of the tissue and it might keep the spatial information more intact. Mm -hmm. That we, we don't know if that was a good call or not, but that was at least the, the, the promise of it. And also that it's easier to just go back to archival slides mm -hmm. as well without having to disintegrate it but so, it's a fair point and a related question um why did you decide to have mass spec as your downstream readout rather than uh rna and then take advantage maybe of a spatial rna technique yes well as i showed you for example for the cell cycle and the, also these me metabolic proteins that vary they are most the metabolic proteins are like to the largest extent we see these variations in transcriptionally identical cells. So we expect this is a phenomenon that is probably regulated at the post-translational, translational, post-translational post level. So we don't expect to be able to read it out at the RNA level. So that's why we want a pro protein downstream readout. Also because proteins are just more interesting. <laughs> what are some of the challenges of the 3D nature of the tissue data? And how do you know when you're seeing a true signal or it's just an artifact of having taken the 2D slice? Well, I think almost that's almost a question for our previous speaker. It's like <laughs> we're doing 2D sections. It's so much information already. We have, yeah, and, and we're struggling already with like the, the spatial, small spatial environments, large spatial environments, and then it's a 2D section and in which direction was this section compared to other sections. So there's just, I think we're very far from, from interpreting anything in 3D. So unfortunately, we're just ignorantly going to go with the 2D dimension for now. And kind of a related question to one of the uh, previous in-person questions. Um, what validation is necessary when you see a protein uh, expressed somewhere that you weren't expecting? Yes. So you need validation. If, if you're working with cells, if you can knock down that gene, like protein, crisp it out, that's a very good validation to see that your target actually disappears in all compartments. Uh, if that's not possible, Maybe you can use a positive and a negative cell line or a tissue sample where you have RNA data to support this gene is expressed here. It's not expressed here. That can also be pretty powerful. We in the Protein Atlas have also always worked with paired antibodies. So we develop at least two antibodies that target different epitopes for each protein. So then we can use them to support each other. 
but sometimes there might be like a splice version or something. So that's not a hundred percent method, but it's pretty straightforward and easy. So if you know your target epitopes, I would do that. Awesome. Well, please join me in thanking Emma for a really great talk. Next up, we have uh, John Hickey, who is a uh, incoming faculty member uh, with just starting his own lab. So if he doesn't uh, advertise positions, just know that they are available uh, if you're interested in his work. And he'll be telling us about the human intestine. Cool. Thanks, uh, Noah, Sean, and Mike for putting on a, a great symposium. I've really enjoyed all the talks. and. Uh, Excited to tell you today a little bit about the work that I've done while I've been here at Stanford. And um, let's see, get this moving. Okay, great. And uh, particularly about the healthy human intestine. Um, and this was mentioned before, this kind of piggybacks off what um, previous speakers have said, and, and, and is a view of how I see tissues and organs as this multi-scale network of interactions, right? And Emma kind of described down from the cell level to the protein. But even, even from that, you know, you have intracellular interactions within cells that lead to then intercellular interactions between cells, then to these cellular communities that are conserved organizations of cells that then form functional tissue units that then form our tissues. And, you know, we've been able to measure these independent of each other really well in the past several decades. But I think some of the new technologies coming out allow us to measure these across scales. And I think connecting these components across scales is really what will help drive biology and medicine forward. And, you know, a lot of consortia have recognized this. And one of these consortia is HubMap, which you've heard about as well before, which is mapping healthy tissue and uh, cells in, in healthy tissues of uh, humans. And, you know, there's already a lot of data sets already out there and not just spatial data sets, but also single cell data sets that you can use as a, a, a helpful reference for your own studies. Um, and we've been a part of this effort and it's not just the data that, that we're in, expected to collect. And it's partly also generating protocols thinking about how we're uh, doing data processing, how we're thinking about metadata that should be associated with these new technologies. How do we develop reagents that are robust? What type of data normalization strategies? Once we actually have the data, how do we actually call cell types? And how do we make this machine readable so that this could be standardized and also used by newer algorithms? And you know, while these things can seem a little boring, I think that this is a, a, an amazing foundation of for the data, not only for us to generate high quality data, but for consortia and, and science at large to generate high quality data. And so, you know, we use that foundation to collect this data across the healthy human intestine. And we were interested in collecting, starting at the duodenum, um, which is the upper end of the small intestine closest to the stomach, all the way down to the sigmoid colon. And we took four different areas of the small intestine and four different areas of the colon and compared across them uh, molecularly and cellularly. And so um, we did codex multiplex imaging. Here's an example image from the intestine. I'll just orient you. Here, this magenta part is the epithelial layer of the intestine, which is closest to the lumen of the intestine where, you, where digestion occurs. And then this area is the stromal area uh, in between the mucosa and the muscle layer called the submucosa. And then this red part here is uh, the muscle layer. And this is just showing a, a couple of the antibodies that we developed. We wanted to develop our antibody panel that, that could represent all the different areas of the intestine, the epithelial layer, immune cells, including immune follicles, both developing and within this, the submucosa, all the inter... Uh, mucosal uh, immune cells and the development of the epithelial cell layers from the bottom of the crypt up to the toward, uh, top of the lumen. You know, those are pretty pictures, but to quantify it, and, and people talked about this, especially on the first day, how we have to apply different methods for cell segmentation. And there's been a lot of advancements, but even, even so, there's still a lot of issues with cell segmentation or unsupervised cell type clustering. And this process of go, going from image to a plot like this, where we're describing and defining each individual cell type still takes a lot of time to get a high quality one. Uh, it takes a lot of going back and forth and validating uh, with human eye. And 
you know, for the type and amount of data that we were expected to generate for this project, this was going to be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of work for me. And so I reached out to uh, Maria Burbick, who's uh, who was a postdoc here. She has her own group at EPFL now, um, who developed machine learning algorithms um, for pictures, classifying pictures, basically. And so what we did is develop this algorithm called Stellar which uses the spatial features of the data set. So it uses both the um, cell type labels of individual cells, their molecular features, but it also uses the neighbors of that cells labels and molecular features. So that, that is assuming there's inherent order and structure in the data that you're acquiring. And, and interestingly, that was uh, very helpful in annotating an unlabeled uh, graph data set. So, um, the, the, one of the unique things too that Maria built into this uh, algorithm is that it is also not only able to recognize known cell types, but can also identify unknown cell types for you to further label. So here's an example of one of our uh, intestinal images where you can see the colors are represent the individual cell types from this. And then when we apply our stellar prediction, you can see that there's generally good agreement. And so we could use this algorithm to take a reference set that we built off of a donor and then apply it to all of our other donors um, that we had across millions of cells that we characterize. And then this allows us to categorize different cell types and how they change from the, the top of the small intestine to the, the bottom of the lower intestine. And there's lots of really interesting biology here. One of my, the things that I was most interested in though was um, this correlation that we saw with M1 macrophages that actually didn't change too much across the small intestine to the large intestine, but um, this correlation was with the body mass index of the individuals that donated the intestine. And body mass index um, you, has these several different categories um, by the NIH. Um, and what you can see that this M1 macrophage, it's uh, a type of inflammatory uh, macrophage and it's correlated strongly positively with BMI. And one of the reasons that this is interesting is BMI is known to be associated with gastrointestinal diseases. And this increase in M1 macrophages could be a, uh, you know, a precursor for this, these diseases because none of these donors had any indication of gastrointestinal disease. Um, what was further interesting is these M1 macrophages, we have the spatial locations for these were localized primarily to the mucosal areas of the intestine, whereas their M2 count less in, uh, you know, not inflammatory macrophages, the M2 or resident macrophages were distributed across all the different tissue compartments. And, you know, we followed up with this with Magda, who's another amazing uh, postdoc here, who's really interested in macrophage biology. She's looked at additional flavors besides just M1 and M2 macrophage. She defined those by publicly available single cell RNA sequencing data sets. And she looked further in both the intestine and breast for these different subset of macrophages and indeed found spatial restrictions of these subtypes of macrophages even further than what we observed here in this, in this paper. And, you know, I think I really liked Emma's uh, car picture. And this is kind of something that I think as well of reconstructing something that's very complex. You know, we've done a really good job of categorizing all the different types of pieces. And now we, we have to figure out how these pieces fit together right into these modules. And, and not only these modules, um, but we have to go how modules fit together with other modules. And I think that as we move towards this direction, we'll start to understand the, the different layers and how they talk to each other. And, and one way we do this is through this multicellular neighborhood identification. This is pretty simple, and I, I've explained this before, but um, basically we take compositional windows across our tissue, turn these into vectors, and cluster these just like we would cluster a cell type to generate these areas of com similarly composed um, cell neighborhoods, basically. So what does this look like for the intestine? So here we have our codex fluorescent imaging. Here's the cell type definitions for that specific piece. And then if we run our neighborhood analysis, then we can start to generate the cellular neighborhoods for this piece. So an example being, you know, we can see that there's a distinct outer follicle and an inner follicle cellular neighborhood that are defined by different compositions of cells. We can also see the vasculature is defined 
by specific uh, compositions of cells. And so what does this look like computationally? Well, you, what you can do is plot this as a heat map of enriched cell types or depleted cell types within this cellular neighborhood. One example is this plasma cell enriched neighborhood. Obviously, based on what we named it, um, it's enriched for plasma cells. Uh, it's depleted in a lot of these epithelial cells, several types of immune cells, but also enriched for CD4 T cells, antigen presenting cells. And um, th this, this community or this neighborhood is really interesting here, but I'm going to take a slight detour and ensure why it's interesting in a few other studies that we've been a part of. So another study that we I, I've worked on with this codex multiplex imaging is looking at how chronically inflamed tissues have a higher risk for developing cancer and in some cases do develop cancer. And one example is Barrett's esophagus, where you have chronic reflux disease that causes you know, chronic inflammation within the esophagus. And what we found is, you know, it changes the epithelial layer from a normal squamous epithelial layer to more of an intestinal-like epithelial layer. But also what we found um, within these samples is that there are these plasma cell neighborhoods that pop up. Basically, when we see the intestinal-like epithelial cells, these plasma cell neighborhoods are brought along. And, um, that is really interesting because if we characterize both non-progressors and progressor samples, so people who have Barrett's esophagus who progress towards cancer versus those who just remain at this metaplastic state, we see that there's an increase of these plasma cell um, neighborhoods within people who are protected, basically, so who don't progress. So these plasma cell neighborhoods seem to play a protective role in this metaplastic or intestinal-like epithelial cell state. Another study that we're a part of is we're looking at in head and neck cancer, why some people will develop uh, lymph node metastases versus others who, who don't. And so we have many different cores from head and neck patients, but also matching corresponding lymph node metastasis biopsies or healthy lymph node biopsies. And um, one of the interesting things that we found is that people who don't have metastases, have a higher enrichment of these plasma cell enriched neighborhoods. And, and I should mention, both in this case and also in the um, metaplastic uh, esophageal um, disease, these plasma cell neighborhoods look very similar to the cell neighborhoods that we find in the intestine. And what we see in both cases, they're protective against further development of cancer or metastasis. Okay, so coming back to our intestinal neighborhoods, you know, we can de determine what all these different neighborhoods, map them back to the tissue and understand kind of the coordination of these neighborhoods. But what, one thing that's interesting to me is that, you know, this, this vasculature is not the same as this vasculature, which is not the same as this vasculature. They, indeed, the cellular neighborhoods have their own spatial context, if you will. Um, and so, you know, how do we think about analyzing these hierarchical spatial domains? And there's a lot of cool stuff that I'm excited to try out in terms of, you know, uh, geospatial things uh, that others have talk talked about. But, it, you know, we, we can, we already have this type of concept within geography, right? So there are many neighborhoods that form counties, many counties that then form states, and then et cetera, states that forms a, form a country. And so I thought, you know, why not apply this same concept to our cellular neighborhoods to understand multi-level um, con connectivity of these spatial domains? And so here's an example of a, a small intestine image and a colon image with the cell types. We can then define the cellular neighborhoods as we've done before. And then we can think about neighborhoods of neighborhoods, which we termed communities, which are these higher order structure, structures. And then we can go even further to do larger scale, like that, that end up de defining tissue units, which are these basically coalesce into these pathology defined units that have been known for a long time. But the, the unique thing about defining these from the ground up, up is then we can see how everything is connected to each other and the relationships between all of these features. And you can learn a lot from a, a, a graph like this, but I'll just highlight one interesting example, which is this 
adaptive immune enriched community. And one of the reasons that it's really interesting is that it's an intersection of multiple immune cell neighborhoods and epithelial cell neighborhoods. And uh, an, another reason that it was really interesting is if we look at where it actually is within the samples, uh, we can zoom in, it's this orange community. It's right at the base of the, the crypt of the epithelium. And this is the area where the stem cells are of the, of the um, intestine. This is a highly conserved area. And people have studied this area for a long time and really focused on uh, fibroblasts, but also the area just right below where the fibroblasts are, are is this conserved area of adaptive immune cells, particularly CD4s and CD8s that we, we found and is uh, structured. The other thing that you can notice is that it seems to be that the intestine is layered as you move closer to the lumen. No matter how, how the mucosa is twisted, right? You can see that cellularly it's layered as you go up. And we found that it was particularly layered also for uh, immune cells. And so we can just now describe quantitatively what these immune cell layers are as you move closer to the intestine. Um, we also, you know, I mentioned that there were several different data types that we acquired for this. We also acquired single cell RNA-seq and single cell attack-seq for all of these samples. And um, there's a lot of really interesting things that we learned about the development of cell types within the intestine. But um, we thought it, it, it is a shame to not use these um, cell types altogether. And so Bokai, who is a talented PhD student who's graduated and moved on to a postdoc, developed this algorithm called MaxFuse, which basically takes linked and unlinked data features from two different modalities. So like uh, codex multiplex imaging and single cell RNA-seq or attack-seq and finds uh, a shared feature space for them to basically integrate uh, across different modalities. And you can take, this will be out soon, but there's also a preprint that you can take a look at more details. So here we've, we've used MaxFuse to co-embed the cells from um, single cell RNA-seq and codex into the same uh, space. And then what we can do is we can see, you know, we can match the, the cell type labels from both onto that same space. And we can see that they overlap quite well. We can look at goblet cells, for instance, which are a type of secretory uh, epithelial cells of the intestine. And we can also overlay based on what RNA and protein that they're expressing. So MUC2 is uh, a common marker that's shown to, to mark goblet cells. So then what can we do with this integrated data that is at the single cell molecular level and also has these spatial features. And since we've already defined these large communities of cells, we thought, okay, can we look at differential gene expression from the, the match cells of these different communities? And so we did that. And here, this is a heat plot of basically the differential expressed genes from these match cell types in the single cell data, but mapped back spatially. And if we take one example and just look at the outer follicle type uh, neighborhood, we can start to see a lot of gene enrichment programs that we might expect to see within the um, outer follicle neighborhood. So uh, I'll just conclude with, you know, I think that there, I, I didn't highlight one of these things, um, but with the macrophages, having metadata and clinical metadata, even with quote unquote healthy tissue, was really important to understand some of these cellular differences. And you know, the, the macrophage will, will continue to subset cell types spatially. There are spatially restricted cell types that are, are, are uh, a subtype of uh, the, you know, the phenotypes that we might see in single cell assays. Um, having this hierarchical view of the intestine was really important to help connect proteins all the way up to tissue level function. And then, you know, continuing to integrate across these multimodalities will help. These are synergistic contributions as opposed to just additive. Um, you know, just to highlight very briefly of like some of the things that we're working on now and hopefully in the future is, you know, these, a lot of these modalities are taking snapshots of a very dynamic system. And, but it potentially, if we take enough of them, we can hopefully recreate the processes that are going on to recreate videos. And we're starting to do that through disease processes, 
by taking snapshots over time and thinking about computational ways to reconstruct that. Um, I'm very interested in T cell therapies and particularly think spatial responses, especially within solid uh, tumors is important to understand. Starting to do multi-scale modeling, building off kind of what was uh, said earlier to help us leverage and create dynamics from these spatial responses or static spatial images. You know, a lot of what we use is this data for cell type maps, but thinking about signaling maps, I think is also really important. And thinking about how do we move to, to 3D like others have mentioned in the past. Uh, really, really, a thank you to a lot of people, um, especially within the Snyder and Greenleaf Lab that helped contribute to the intestine of the HubMap project. And um, I, I, my lab will be open, so I did mention it. Um, and happy to take questions. Great, I'll start with some of the online ones. Please feel free to walk up to the microphone if you have any. Um, can you talk more about how you integrated the single cell RNA-seq and codex data? Does it require like serial sections? What are the, um, in order to get that working? No, it does not require serial sections. Um, and basically what it uses is both the entire feature space first to learn Basically, first you learn within the, the feature space, so like say single cell RNA-seq, how similar are the different cells within that space to each other, and then separately for codex, and then it uses that to look at the shared features and, and kind of modify those shared features. So you're not just using the shared features, you're using these this whole, you know, lower dimensional kind of fuzzy smoothing of the, the linked features to match them. So yeah, you don't need multiple sections. I mean, probably the more data better, but um, no, yeah. Great. Um, what are your strategies in determining the boundary or size of neighborhoods and annotating their identity? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, I, I, I would say it depends on your scientific question of interest, right? Because you can think about how you can change parameters in the neighborhood analysis. Right now, you know, well, I was interested in this study, so I guess I can give my philosophy on this study, is here I really wanted to see multiple scales of tissue organization and cellular organization. So at the very small scale where my cellular neighborhoods, I looked at the 10 nearest neighbors of each cell and then classified those basically and, and then how do you choose the number of neighborhoods right because you can with clustering define infinite number of all the way down to like two clusters um here we use two approaches one is um an elbow plot basically on the number of clusters once you know the number of variants goes down but then also over clustering and just visually expecting inspecting and understanding what is the actual variance in terms of neighborhood organization and composition is really helpful whenever doing this. Um, so both of those techniques, and then you know going up another level, you know at the next level I'm using a hundred nearest neighbors to to get a broader sense. And so you know if your biology that you're interested in is happening, the functional tissue units is on the order of ten to twenty cell neighbors, then maybe that's a good place to start. That's usually how I approach it. Yeah. What type of validation are you planning on doing or is necessary uh, in, in experimental models for the findings um, that you have here? Um, that, that is a good question. So some of the, the validations that we did in the paper were just additional assays. So we, we did spatial transcriptomics to validate some of the, you know, integration aspects between the spatial and RNA. Um, we didn't do any animal experiments. I think, you know, if I was going to continue the, the intestinal biology in the future, which I probably won't, um, but, you know, understanding why there's a need for adaptive immune cells toward the base of the crypt is something that I would be most interested or this relationship of the M1 macrophages showing up in high BMI. Like those are two interesting questions that I think are unresolved. And another one being, and this was one that I could follow up with potentially is we saw people who had a history of hypertension had 
uh, a much lower degree of CD8 T cells within these intraepithelial spaces. So these are immune cells that directly sit in these in between epithelial cells in the tight junctions and play really important roles in terms of immunity. And no one's described that feature as well. And, and those cells, having those cells is really important and probably associated with cancer development. So, you know, I, I, I don't have any immediate plans for, for that, but there's a lot of really interesting things that could be done, you know, with mouse models. What software uh, or packages were you using for your neighborhood and spatial analysis and are they available? Um, here we're using custom code, but we, meaning me and another postdoc and another student, have been working on a pipeline that hopefully will be able to release soon. Um, but if people are interested, I, I'm happy to share code. Um, how do you decide how to uh, take what might be a continuum of cell phenotypes and put it into discrete cell clusters like M1 versus M2? I mean, I think this is a philosophical question more than anything, right? So I, you know, because, you know, once you get down to this clustering, you can cluster major cell types, but you can always go further. And, you know, thinking about dynamic data as well, and kind of what Emma was talking about, about these dynamic changes, a lot of the, the fuzziness we see in these, the data is probably biologically relevant, right? And so I think, again, it just comes back to the scientific question of interest. Here we were interested in major phenotypes and we probably could have gone even deeper with some of the extra markers, but um, just time and mostly time reasons, we didn't go further. But yeah, I think, you know, if your question is about a certain sub phenotype of a T cell, then, you know, you go there. Yeah. Have you thought about using generative AI to predict uh, the behavior of different cell types in different neighborhoods? Um, I, I don't know how I would in like describe their behavior in different neighborhoods um, with generative AI. That would be interesting if there, whoever wants to follow up will follow up with me and give me their insights. But, um, you know, I've thought about generative AI in the way that Emma is doing with this, these, this basically at the cellular level. I think with it, it'll take a, a bit more data, but using building artificial tissues from these tissues would be really interesting, um, and especially within these atlasing efforts as well. And, and going back to kind of what Barbara said, you know, if you can have a, a common coordinate system and then you have tons of data, could you artificially generate what the average? tissue is like, right? So, yeah. Awesome. Well, please join me in thanking John for a great talk. And next up, we have Joachim Lundberg, who will be telling us about spatial multiomics in a single tissue section. So how do you advance this one? So thank you so much for the invitation to this exciting event. Um, I'm going to uh, have a little bit slightly different. I'm, I'm an RNA person, so I'll talk about the RNA presence in the tissue. Uh, so first of all, I would like to acknowledge the people that has done the work that I will talk about today. It's an amazing group at Salaf Lab Stockholm. And these guys are then working in the fields of technology development, where I really started off, um, and then developing the tools to look into spatial data and finally biology. And this presentation will give some small vignettes on these three topics. Um, one of my students said the other day that I cannot show this image if I want to recruit people because this is February in Stockholm. Uh, so I actually made a new slide. Uh, so the, it's the same guys, but you could, if you want to find a nice uh, position in Stockholm, you could actually have some nice weather as well. So uh, four topics, uh, some of the motivation going into spatial uh, that we share, I guess, all of us, um, technology, uh, computational biology and biology, and some different uh, areas of uh, applications. But the common topics is really to try to do as much as possible from that single tissue section. So um, 
many years ago, we tried to analyze the complete transcriptome. And the tools at that time was really based on microarrays, spotted arrays with probes on the surface, or next generation sequencing. Obviously at that time, this was amazing uh, tools. Uh, and if we would like to take that type of tools into space, it was not really any method around. The option I was doing to was to design a probe to query your transcript within the cell, uh, like in situ hybridization, or taking your antibody and look for your protein. And these types of approaches has been extremely useful to establish the Allen Brain Atlas, uh, as well as the Human Protein Atlas. But the, from a technical point of view, it's not very efficient. It's very low degree of multiplexing, as we know. So this is really the starting point for some of the work that we developed uh, uh, for many years, which is spatial transatomics, where we took advantage of sequencing as well as these barcoded strategies on glass slides. So what we do in, in, in the standard workflow is to take out a sample, uh, you do sectioning of that, you place that on a glass surface with a barcoding system on the surface. And in each spot, you have a poly T capture probe to capture the mRNA, the complete transcriptome, but also contains a spatial barcode. And that is then harvested uh, and analyzed by sequencing. And then you could look, what, look for the patterns of gene expression. And I will actually uh, talk about that a bit more, obviously, but also how we could apply this to analyze the DNA in a spatial context. So we capture uh, the complete transcriptome in each and every spot, uh, so we have a pretty good idea of what's happening. So this type of technology was then acquired by 10x uh, a few years back, and now it's called Visium. Uh, and, and if you look into the data, there's quite a lot of data sets today on the Visium, which is good for the data mining part. But it's also extremely exciting to see all the new technologies come around the corner, because as I feel it, uh, the different technologies are providing complementary um, data types and information to better understand histology. So this is a field that is, uh, is being revolutionizing. Uh, the, uh, understanding of biology, and it's been kind of coined spatially resolved transcriptomics, um, and Nature Methods was kind of clever to identify this area in 2020, as you see that the, the number of publications are increasing, and I guess this audience is well aware of that, and on the cover you actually see one of these spatial experiments with a barcoded surface uh, and hidden testing and uh, data-driven patterns. So you could uh, basically separate the, uh, these kind of technologies into image-based, where you actually use a probe to query your transcript, and the degree of multiplexing has increased over, uh, over the years, or you could focus on the sequencing-based uh, strategies. Um, and obviously, in many times, you have to make a combination of these ones. What is not really clear by these technologies, if we think about the sequencing technologies on the right side here, is that Fine, they could they state that they could take the entire transcriptome, but indeed uh, sparseness is something that is, is a common problem with these ones. So one of the things with the Vision platform is is uh, a challenge with these is the limited resolution, as you have several cells in a spot, but you could actually deconvolute that today quite efficiently, and then you have the that there's no information between the spots. And you could address that in different ways. Um, we have uh, introduced an expansion protocol uh, recently in a fantastic collaboration with Stanford, but we've also developed HDST. And, and those kind of techniques is really just to overcome the, the resolution aspects. So these uh, two papers, uh, the expansion SD was recently published uh, together with Bo Wang here at Stanford and the high resolution was some old data. And this is either then increasing the, the, the tissue by expansion microscopy and putting that on, on a barcoded array or you could do very small uh, beads uh, increasing the resolution. But again, it's, the data is very, very sparse. Over the year, we also work with uh, trying to adapt this kind of technology for FFP, to look for isoforms, and I'll come back to that later on. And we could actually rescue samples, uh, poor RNA quality rescue. But going back to the resolution, there are actually ways to also address this um, uh, the barcoded uh, by by the bar the 
sparseness of barcodes or the resolution by using computational approaches. So we developed a deep learning uh, strategy where we actually bring in also the h and &E image that we take within this uh, technology and combine that with this uh, spatial information. And the get, uh, idea then is to create some type of super result expression. So this deep learning model was thus presented some time ago. I just want to give you a flavor how in, impressive data can become when you do this type of deep learning. The examples comes from the mouse olfactory bulb, which is the canonical uh, tissue to do a tech dev on, um, where you have very nice morphology. And this is just looking into one single gene, the dust protein gene, which is expressed in the granular or the micro layer of this olfactory bulb. And that's what you see on the top to the right. This is some old uh, spatial data. The uh, first generation, really. And the color code is, is orange, means that you have a lot of expression of that particular gene. And you could actually see there's a lot of information that we're missing between the spots, uh, but also the spot size are, are kind of large as well. In the middle panel, um, you actually see these uh, deep learning output. This is the super resolved ST. And you actually provide a cellular resolution by combining these two uh, modalities. And you could validate that by in situ hydration uh, from the Allen Brain Atlas. And you, indeed, you could see that the patterns look very similar. So this is a very good way to then to increase the resolution of gene expression over uh, the tissue. And this is just one example. Um, this is from a project also with Stanford, where we looked at squamous cell cancer. And you have the fantastic H&E image, very informative. Uh, and on the top right, you see the, uh, the cluster data uh, placed over the tissue, and that this is the resolution you have really with the Visium. But if you then combine the information from the H&E that you see on the left side, you can see a much more continuous view of the gene expression. And this is really clear when you look for the empty spaces here indicated in with the narrow, which you don't really appreciate when you look at the ST data natively, uh, but if you do a super result, you could actually pinpoint these uh, open, kind of indicating how far we could take this with deep learning. So I'm going to focus on two tech uh, vignettes that I think is relevant. Uh, one is a multimodal approach to use mass spec that we heard quite a bit about yesterday. And the other one is to analyze the immune system in more detail. Um, and these will be out shortly uh, next week. So um, we try to use uh, our tools, our uh, of different toolkits to analyze different biology questions in, and we try to establish cell atlas uh, as an interest in, in cell atlasing using these tools. We look into neurological disease and cancer. And this specific example comes from the middle one, the neurological disease, which is always is a disease that progresses slowly over a long time, meaning that you have very subtle gene expression differences that is hard to pinpoint. And you could address these in two ways. Uh, one is just to expand the number of samples to increase the power analysis. And did, indeed, we did this for an ALS uh, paper published some years ago, where we had hundreds of tissue sections that were analyzed. The other way of doing this is to use the multimodality to increase the power of analysis. And multimodality for us means obviously looking at the RNA, getting protein data, getting genome data, and also attack seek data. And all of these are published today. But what we have recently done is to increase the capabilities by looking uh, on mass spec. And the aim again is to do as much as possible on that single tissue section. So we're using uh, multi mass spec as described yesterday, uh, using the uh, mass spectra to analyze, uh, to analyze the metabolites, the lipids or the peptides. But what's clear from this short movie is that we're using laser. And the anticipation was that laser will hurt the RNA in the samples. Uh, so we challenged this um, uh, by using uh, these barcoded slides. We place tissue sections on these ones. And this is what you see on the uh, left side. And then we spray these tissue sections with different matrices in order to capture the lipids or the, in this case, neurotransmitters, uh, but also um, peptides. 
we perform multi-MSI on the slides that we have these barcoding um, um, patterns. Um, and then we clean it off with methanol, we fix it with uh, standard uh, reagents, do our HNE, so we get the morphology. And on top of that, we could then do spatial transcriptomics. Uh, so we could actually create a multimodal view of, of uh, this uh, mouse brain. And what is kind of exciting then is to see that this is actually working. And we show this by, by several ways. Um, and in the middle plot, in the middle U map, you actually see the four different, three different matrices and a control. And you can see the different matrices do not affect the RNA that is present. Uh, and it works equally well as a control that has, no, uh, has not been treated by the MSI at all. And indeed, also the UMAP space to the right shows you all the different uh, clusters we obtain. So indeed, we are obtaining both mass spec data and spatial data within the same tissue section. And this is really powerful because we would like to look for metabolites that are very diffusive. So you could actually map uh, spatial data, find out which cell types there are, and on top of that, you could add this uh, new modality. And the power of that um, is really uh, how to correlate gene expression and mass spec. And I think uh, to the right, uh, you actually see one of those analysis, uh, uh, multimodal analysis of gene expression and mass spec. And we're then focusing on Parkinson's disease, a slow developing disease. Uh, and the marker uh, molecule here is dopamine um, and the lack of dopamine in, in disease. So I identify this small uh, correlation cluster, the small square on the top there. And when we look into this mass spec, we identify dopamine, which is 674 uh, in the mass spectra. And on the gene expression that is co-correlated with is you find two market uh, genes for uh, Parkinson, the PCP4 and TAC1. But what's so exciting is that we also see a lot of new genes that has never been identified in disease progression by using this correlation analysis. If we have done these analysis uh, independently, we would not see these kind of patterns. So that's the strength of this. So, um, I also have then another tech dev kind of thing that relates to our efforts on cancer. Uh, we are involved in a large effort on breast cancer with the Garvin Institute in Sydney, uh, where they have 300 breast cancer uh, cases. And our contribution to this is to look into the spatial uh, part of it. And a particular interest for this uh, effort is to understand the immune cells uh, in the context of tumors. And today, you could easily, with single cell RNA sequencing or the standard Visium, you could identify B and T cells by sequencing the three prime end of the uh, transcripts. But again, we would, would like to increase the granularity to identify which clones, which specific clones are linked to specific uh, tumors. So for that, we developed a strategy, uh, again, using the spatial barcoding scheme we generate a library and that library is actually full length before you do uh, further preparations of that. So from this library, we divide it into two different channels in a way. One that you do full length sequencing by bio uh, in order to analyze the variable sequence of the uh, TCR and uh, Ig uh, uh, molecules. The other uh, flow of information is really we do the standard um, gene expression analysis, focusing on the three prime end. So hereby we could stack layers again from the same tissue section. We could have the h &E, we could, could get the data-driven patterns, what data is telling us, and then we could get the clonotypes of T and B cells. So I just want to stress that this type of analysis would not be able with this image-based technologies as we are looking into a variable region. Um, yes. So this study is very much focusing on tonsil and, and uh, but also includes some clinical applications. And one is then breast cancer, where we have two patients uh, looking at different uh, parts of, of the of the biopsy. And for and we're just I'm going to show one case of patient two, 
uh, where you actually then are, are working with the pathologist to annotate these tissue sections. And we could identify, well, they identify invasive cancer, some stroma, uh, and it looks nice like this. We could then onto this add our gene expression patterns. Um, and we could identify three clusters uh, of tumor signatures. And they are spatially uh, defined to three different areas within this single tissue section. So this is uh, uh, clone three, clone five, and clone eight. So these are tumor cells. Uh, and they overlay with the histology that was annotated by the pathologist. But what, what's super interesting now is to understand where are the immune cells and what kind of clonotypes do they have? So we're using this kind of strategy with PacBio to identify the CDR uh, sequences uh, within this same uh, section. So this is just showing a, a glimpse of that. This is B cell clones. So we sequence the CDR3, we have the spatial barcode, we could place that into a spatial context. And clone zero has a unique CDR sequence and it's placed uh, on the upper part of the tissue section. Uh, the clone 39 is down to the right. And if you recall, these were actually two different uh, tumor regions. So we could actually then combine that with the tumor clones and we could see that, uh, that these immune cells are located by the tumors, which is really a nice feature. But indeed, we could get the information to an even higher degree because we could place them in the context of the tumor. And we could see that these clonotypes, on the upside, we see some six clonotypes with unique CDR. Uh, they are all placed at the border. Uh, and that's also true for the uh, uh, other clone, uh, tumor clone. Number five, they're also placed at the at the border, which is super sexy, actually. So you could actually see that different clonotypes go to different tumor types. And I think that's uh, going to be a Pandora's box. Uh, the last part um, where we're doing multimodality um, is, is when we study different organs. And we have tried to do as large, uh, as much as we can on whole organ kind of perspective. <laughs> to get as much as possible because we're using this type of exploratory technology we could describe tissues according to gene expression and i'm going to give an example on the prostate where we actually used the rna that we obtained to infer the dna and this kind of trick has been done for single cells quite a lot so we took the entire uh, prostate uh, and did a cross section of the entire prostate we take this into small cubes uh, in the dimensions of pi by five. We place them on these glass surfaces. And on these uh, tissue sections, we have two pathologists that independently uh, is scoring our tissues. We run spatial transitomics. We get the spatial data or gene expression. And then we take that RNA to predict the, uh, the copy number variations gross uh, genomic changes uh, in the samples. So this is indeed another way of, of doing spatial multimodal on a single tissue section. And our very naive idea early on was to study uh, the multifocal uh, tumors in prostate because that's uh, one of the hallmarks of prostate. So what you see here down to the left is, is what we anticipated. We would like to understand the relationships between the different tumors within this patient to make a clonal tree. Uh, and but I just want to stress in each and every spot, we get the complete transcriptome. So we could actually infer the complete genome in each and every spot. So we anticipated to have some type of relational patterns uh, in, uh, in neighborhoods of these tumor types. So in this experiment, we analyzed more than 150,000 small spots, which could be compared to laser capture micro dissection technologies that you, know, you don't run that many. So it's really high power and high resolution uh, from that perspective. So when you do this kind of, of inference, uh, you have to have a, a reference. You have to have a patient specific reference to make it to work. So we use the information from the pathologist to collect all the normal epithelium uh, spots uh, to create this reference. And obviously the anticipation at that point was that uh, normal epithelium does not carry any genetic changes. So what you see here is an hierarchical clustering of all the spots uh, from this prostate. Um, 
And uh, if you haven't seen these kind of gains and loss uh, patterns before, so on the y-axis, you have each spot, and along the x-axis, you have gain and losses through the different chromosomes. So you could clearly see a reference here that has no gains and losses. Uh, gain and loss is uh, indicated by brown or blue. So we have found a reference. But doing this, we also find another curiosity. We actually saw regions, spots that has clear gains and losses that the pathologist indicated this was normal uh, benign epithelial cells. So we initially thought this was technical, but uh, since we have spatial data, we could actually uh, uh, dig into that uh, further. So we done this uh, and we selected one single tissue section on the left side here, the H21, to see what these benign changes uh, imply really. So what you see here is one of these uh, hierarchical clustering for one single tissue section, five by five millimeter. Um, and you could actually see a pattern here of strong gains and losses uh, over each and every spot. So on the top side, you have no gains and losses. The, and we uh, make the nomenclature that this is clone A. And clone B has some uh, gains and losses, and C has a lot of gain and uh, changes. Uh, and what's the key point here is that A, B, and C is in the microscope uh, called as normal epithelium, uh, while E, F, and G are tumors. Uh, so what's so cool here is that we could actually compare them, the gene and losses in benign, healthy epithelium just beside the tumor. Um, so we could actually make, uh, make a tree of all the events. And this is all events with a single tissue section. Uh, and here we see A, B, and C, and C is uh, normal benign, and it carries a lot of genetic changes. And it carries some of those hallmarks for, for um, prostate, the MYC and P10. Again, this is a single tissue section uh, analysis is really uh, striking. But the important part is that we could place this in a spatial context that really uh, drives in the message. So this is histology. Uh, the blue parts are the normal epithelium called by the pathologist, and the red here is uh, epithelium that, well, cancer, uh, the different gradings of, of uh, prostate cancer. So we take our data-driven clusters, uh, and then we could see how they relate to each other. So green were actually benign without any genomic differences. The orange, the yellow one is carrying a lot of genetic changes. And they are side by side. And this to us tells me that there's something relate, uh, related here, which are then uh, adjacent to the tumors. So somehow we capture the evolution of a tumor in a single tissue section. And this is, I think, extremely interesting for, for the future. So um, I just want to uh, make a, uh, a big acknowledgement to the people that we work with, which is a lot of amazing scientists. Uh, some of these are here at Stanford, being Bill Bang. We've been working with Paul Kavari uh, quite a bit, and also James So on the uh, deep learning stuff. With that, I would like to thank the funders uh, providing the funds to do this. And then especially the people that has done this. And, and these are the people um, contributing are, are then the college here, like Riesa, Alma, Kim, Louis, Saneta, Michelle, and Marco. With that, uh, I would like to thank you. Awesome. A couple of questions from online. Uh, if anyone has questions, please uh, walk up to the mic. Can you talk about some of the challenges of inferring CNVs from RNA data? And were there anything specific about the spatial nature that either helped or made it more challenging? Yeah, um, that's a super good question. And I kind of alluded to that a little bit. I think the most important part to, uh, to make a good inferred CNV patterns is to use a reference from the same patient. As it turns out that the variation between patient and patient actually, even though you're looking into epithelial cells. Um, so that's the big trick, I think, for that, yeah. Are there other um, types of readouts or modalities that you're excited about combining uh, with RNA in a single slide? Yeah, obviously, uh, what would be nice is to do the DNA. 
um, but that would be very cost um, dependent actually. So, but that, that would be very nice to have. But what's nice, yeah, I think we're getting there somewhere, but it's, it's, it will take some more time. Okay. Uh, so I have maybe an ignorant question as a computational scientist, but when you super resolve with the H and E, is that so? Are you using the H and E and then doing the the RNA sort of extraction and treatment, or can you? Because presumably you can't use a neighboring slide because it would be different enough. But I'm just kind of curious about. Yeah, that. so everything is done on the same as okay. uh, H and E image and the RNA from that uh, image, and both modalities are used in the model. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. So that was RNA data that you had in that mapping. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and the, the green was that, that was PIN, that was prostatic intraepithelial near. Yeah, in the middle there, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's believed to be the precursor to the tumor. Yeah. Um, is there any way you can, so so now you've got the, the benign epithelium. Did all the benign epithelium have abnormal um, clones in it, or was there some that wasn't? Okay, was... uh, thanks. Uh, so there were definitely areas, there were no changes in the genome at all. Mm -hmm. And these were the green areas, uh, the green spots. Okay. And it, if there was some way you could identify that on a biopsy, that would just alter everything because, you know, people get biopsies done and they might miss the tumor. Yeah. But if you can actually identify, actually, that's benign looking tumor to the pathology benign looking cells to the pathologist but here we have a biomarker and maybe it could be something in the blood eventually so yeah yes so uh, a pathologist would have missed the genetic yeah. changes in the brain right so you have to have some molecular assay to capture that right uh, it would be fantastic to have a proxy biomarker for that um, but we don't or maybe circulating dna that could, could look be. for that as well yeah, yeah. But the problem is that you have the tumor as well, right? So you cannot detail where your alterations originate from. So you have to have a spatial readout. But I mean, in the future, you could maybe just take blood from these people who are at risk for prostatic cancer and follow this circulating DNA. Oh, yeah, yeah, level. sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Thank you. How long does it take to run the super resolution analysis on a single paired Visium and HE slide? There are so many flavors. Uh, it's not that easy to say, actually. Um, it depends on your instrument, uh, what kind of infrastructure you have. But it's not that intense. Uh, it's fairly computational, uh, cost efficient. Was it challenging to acquire the granular annotation data from the pathologist about which regions were and were not uh, benign? Uh, well, they did it blindly. Uh, so, and, and I think that is one of the biggest resources of this paper. Uh, there's no one is interested in the paper. They want to have the annotated uh, h and &E images. Uh, fantastic talk. Um, can I ask you, seems like all of uh, your great um, work uh, from uh, 10 uh, Spatial ST, right? So have you compared with other platforms? Um, because I heard some challenges uh, people mentioned for the uh, just challenge 10 resolution. Mm, just want to get your experience. Yes. Thank so you. I mentioned, I think we have to combine a number of different platforms. So indeed, we do other spatial platforms too to validate the findings that we have from here. Okay, thank you. Great, well, join me in thanking uh, Jokin for a really great talk. All right, next up, we have our very own Ina, who's gonna be telling us about the human maternal fetal interface. Do I or do I not look like a floating head? <laughs> Nothing can be done, you know? Okay. So I'll take you through a story about human pregnancy. And as we go through the story, we're going to showcase some tools for spatial analysis that we use for this work. Uh, some of them you've heard about on the first day from Noah and Candace. So motherhood is a balancing act uh, for the immune system as well. And it has to balance between 
the immune tolerance of the fetus to avoid any aberrant immune responses that could lead to complications or miscarriage with still having an active immune system that will protect both mother and fetus from pathogens. It's very interesting, but also very challenging to study because a lot of it has very human specific aspects and conditions like preeclampsia that are severe and they affect something like between four and 5% of pregnancies has not even been documented, not even in chimpanzees and gorillas. There may be one documentation uh, for a gorilla in a zoo, but you know people are not even sure about that. So one of the most crucial things that happen early on in pregnancy is the remodeling of the maternal spiral arteries. You can see here in the leftmost diagram the way the embryo attaches to the maternal tissue, to the decidua. And that is the maternal fetal interface, where the embryo, where the fetus and the mother meet. On the fetal side, we have the placenta villi. These are the things that look like fingers over there. And on the maternal side, you have the spiral arteries, which are just shaped like a spiral. And where they meet in the intravillous space, we have a lot of maternal blood that supplies nutrients and allows for gas exchange from the fetal side. Early on in pregnancy, these uh, spiral arteries, they are small, they are tight, they look like arteries, they're surrounded by smooth muscle, and they look pretty much like this. However, as pregnancy progresses, fetal cells invade from the placenta by attaching the villi and going into the maternal tissue, into the decidua, they enter into the maternal spiral arteries and they start a process of remodeling. So this remodeling process dissolves off the smooth muscle, the trophoblasts, the fetal invasive cells, they get into the arteries, they replace some of the endothelium, and what you end up with is vessels that are big, dilated, and they can supply into this interface blood in a high volume, but low pressure to avoid any injury to the delicate placental and fetal tissues. And if this doesn't happen according to plan, uh, a lot of bad things can happen. You can have severe pregnancy complications, miscarriage, conditions that have been connected to abnormal remodeling include preeclampsia in the uterine growth restriction and others. But there's still many open questions that remain as to how exactly this entire process works, which cells participate, what are their jobs, and how do they collaborate to drive this process. And that is in part due to the challenges of studying a very human-specific process. The depth of invasion of fetal cells into maternal tissue is different even between humans and great apes. Some studies suggest that the reason for this difference is the fact that we walk upright and some adjustments needed to be made for that. Okay, so to tackle this challenge, we generated an atlas uh, that includes both spatial transcriptomics and proteomics of the sidua, the interface itself, from 66 patients who underwent elective terminations with no known fetal or maternal abnormalities between six and 20 weeks of gestation. So on the proteomics arm, we have MIBI. We used a panel of antibodies that was aimed to identify different immune cells, um, structural cells in the tissue, and some functional markers that are immunomodulatory, and et cetera. We imaged all of these uh, in all of these cores by Mebitoff, and then they underwent segmentation with Mesmer and phenotyping of cells with Flosum. And the, on the transcriptomics arm, we use genomics, uh, nanostring genomics, to acquire spatially resolved images of the same cores. We focused on the fetal cells that are invading maternal tissue and on the spiral arteries themselves to see how their transcriptomic program evolves with the process of remodeling. One of the first things we saw was this really coordinated shift in, in the composition of immune cells on the maternal side. And we see that as gestational age you know, goes along, each bar here is one uh, patient and they're arranged according to the gestational age can see a shift from a mainly NK cell immune compartment over to a mainly macrophage one with T cells also declining over time. And here is an image with the cell phenotypes color coded 
on the image and you can kind of see that the color shifts from being more the green color that represents the NKs over to the blue color that represents the macrophages and also a lot of purple for the fetal cells that at this point have invaded the decidua and they're much more abundant in there. What we can look at more than just the frequencies of cells and quantify their temporal, that temporal progression, we can also leverage the spatial aspect of the data to try and infer interactions between cell types. So to do that, we looked for cell types that were preferentially enriched around one another, assuming that if that happens much more than you would expect by chance, this could in lead to an interaction or some sort of collaboration between these cell types. So we characterize these enrichments uh, and their evolution over time with gestational age and also their like static mean enrichment levels. And then we created an a interaction map from these uh, cell cell enrichments that includes you know colorful arrows that indicate trends of enrichments that are evolving over time, red in for declining and blue for increasing and also stable uh, interactions that were presented by the black arrows. So you can see that at the center of this map, we have this macrophage 2A uh, subtype. This subtype is uh, connected with anti-inflammation and with immune tolerance. And you can see that it expresses all sorts of uh, M2 type markers. And interestingly, with gestational age, it upregulates TIM3 and galactin 9, which has been shown to be immunosuppressive in cancer. So the overreaching picture here is that as gestational age progresses, we get less NKs, more macrophages, and these macrophages interact more, even taking into account the fact that their frequency is increasing, they're still increasing the amount of interaction they have in the tissue with NKs and with fetal cells, and they upregulate immune pathways. And this is kind of transforming the decidua into immunotolerant niche. We then focused on the remodeling of spiral arteries itself, and we use manual annotations and machine learning to reconstruct a accurate and highly resolved continuous morphological trajectory for the process itself, taking into account the shape of the artery and also um, the smooth muscle layer and how disrupted it is, the endothelial layer and some other features. And by doing that, we now had basically two time axes in the system. The first is global time, gestational age, but the second is the local pseudo time of artery remodeling that we saw differ even within samples from the same patient. Some areas were more remodeled than others. And this decoupling has allowed us to look again at all these dynamics and all the cell types that are increasing and decreasing in their frequency and connect it specifically to our pseudo time of artery remodeling or to a global time of gestational age. And what we saw when we did that was that, again, mainly the frequencies of immune populations correlated very well with gestational age and not so much with the extent of remodeling, while the presence of fetal cells mostly correlated with remodeling and less so with gestational age. Except one type of NK cells, uh, the NK2 subtype, and that is a cytotoxic phenotype. And when we looked at the enrichment of maternal cells specifically around arteries, we saw that these NK2s, they were preferentially enriched around arteries during the early stages of remodeling. And that happens basically around the time where the smooth muscle layer gets disrupted. Uh, taking into account their, their cytotoxic phenotype, this can indicate that they have a very specific role in dissolving the smooth muscle early on in artery remodeling. And finally, um, the fact that we had spatial measurements both for the transcriptome and for the proteomics allowed us to kind of follow the fetal cells along their route of invasion and characterize the differentiation and the changes that they undergo as they go along. So they start from the attaching villi, then then exit into the decidua, and as they pass through the decidua, they find arteries and they invade them. And we could see um, that there is a shift in the functional markers that they express as they go along this route that also fits a whole transcriptional program of differentiation. You can see the nice images uh, of all the different locations where we found the fetal cells on the bottom. And wow, I'm on time. Thank you.
Really great talk, Ina. I'll start with a question from the chat. Um, what do your findings uh, tell us, if anything, about how this process goes wrong in some of the um, complications you mentioned at the beginning? So if we go back to this slide, all the gene names that we see here in red, they, in the literature, they have been implicated in preeclampsia. And by looking at what happens during healthy pregnancy, and we did some more analysis on possible interactions these genes are involved in, we can try to kind of infer what went wrong and what was the function they were doing and how this got dysregulated in preeclampsia. And we are working on a follow-up paper that's specifically focused on that and trying to kind of infer what goes wrong by comparing our healthy atlas with samples from patients with complications. Hi, I kind of just have a question on like how you determine setting what's an appropriate pixel range to look at enrichment of um, cell types to your target cell type, especially when we're looking at cells um, that don't rely on like cell cell interaction, but more like chemokine um, type interaction. That's a very good question. And we kind of debated it a lot. And also we have two different types of enrichment. We have the enrichment between cells, but also we have these big objects, the arteries, like what is their range of influence? Um, so to do that, we started with numbers that made sense to us when we we're looking at the tissue and the way it's structured. But also what we did was vary that a bit and we were trying to find some sort of uh, robustness because if you change the range just a bit and all of a sudden you get very different results, it's not very reliable. So we kind of combined what we saw by eye, what we knew about the tissue with trying to make sure that it's rather robust, that small changes don't completely throw off what we see. Great, thank you. Thank you, great talk. I kind of had a question about the, if you compare this process with, let's say you have a spatial data from a tumor invading your host tissue, uh, would you predict that you will see similarity in terms of the immune response of, of you know, a, a spatial map of a tumor interacting with the host cells, uh, you know, and the process of implantation? Of yes, I think there are a lot of similarities. There is a lot of literature about how cancer sort of hijacks this natural pathway of invasion and inducing immune tolerance. Uh, in fact, what the fetal cells do as they reach the maternal tissue is some type of EMT. And that allows them to transform into this invasive phenotype that can just kind of go cut through the maternal tissue and get to where they're headed. So yes, there's a lot of uh, similarities. Mm -hmm. And to what extent those, you know, giant trophoblast cells that are like invasive one have uh, interaction with this immune, uh, the maternal immune cells. Can you distinguish that type of interaction, you know, the uh, fetal uh, trophoblast cells uh, and, and the interaction with them? Yeah, so to try to get at interactions with uh, these between the trophoblasts, they're here, they're like the EVTs, there are two subtypes, uh, one and two, they differ by one functional marker. We try to look for uh, maternal immune cells that are preferentially around these fetal cells, assuming that that would indicate that they're interacting. And we did see um, that over time, there is an increased amount of interaction between the fetal cells and these type of M2 type of macrophages that we talked about earlier. Thank you. How did you determine which markers to include on your uh, geomics panel, the morphology markers? Um, oh. Right. So for the morphology markers, so one marker is just the nuclei. Um, so we wanted to target uh, the fetal cells and their marker is HLAG. So we had HLAG and structural markers, Vimentin and SMA to trace the artery. So we can also uh, take some samples from the arteries themselves and look at their descriptional program. I mean, I haven't shown it due to some time restrictions, but that was the idea. Uh, great talk. Uh, I have a specific question regarding the interface between uh, feeders and the maternal, um, especially um, 
as I understand, a certain um, stage uh, um, during the early uh, um, pregnancy, early embryonic stages, when the blood flow um, uh, started in feeders be between the um, uh, interface, mm -hmm. how could you uh, differentiate the immune cells or other cells, you know, from the maternal or generated from feeders? So we looked at the maternal side, uh, the immune cells from the fetal side, they do stay in the placenta, they do not invade, DVTs invade. But at some point we did do a Y chromosome staining to make sure that we don't see uh, any invading cells and we couldn't find fetal immune cells on the maternal side. Okay, thank you. All right, please join me in thanking Ina for a great talk. All right, just a couple um, brief concluding remarks. Um, we had three days, I think, of, of really great talks. Um, it was great to see such a range of different topics. We had kind of methods driven applications to specific problems. We had overview talks, we had a lot of biology. We had a lot of uh, non-biology, which I think was great to see from our um, uh, external speakers. And overall, um, just really great summary, I think, of different things that are going on in the spatial biology field. Uh, couldn't have done this without the speakers. Um, so thank you all for agreeing to come uh, participate in our workshop. Um, it really was because of you all that we had such great um, participation, uh, such great interest, and that it made this whole thing possible. So thank you. Uh, we also couldn't have done it without the sponsors, which is why we had this nice room this time. Uh, last year, it was in a classroom, <laughs> uh, so we really upgraded. So thank you specifically to HubMap uh, and Omero, uh, who helped uh, make this happen. Uh, next year, it will likely be even more expensive. So if you'd like to see your logo here, uh, we are definitely looking for more sponsors. So reach out to us. Uh, we uh, had to cap attendance, so we want to make sure that everyone can continue uh, to come. We were able to offer it free uh, this year in large part due to, uh, due to our funding, so really hoping to continue that. Uh, I know Sean and Mike and myself were the public face of this workshop, but Mina was the one who actually did everything. Uh, she was hiding behind the scenes, and so I wanted to thank her specifically for helping uh, make sure this could uh, actually run. Uh, there's a lot of other people who are involved uh, putting on a workshop really as a team effort. Um, all the Angelo and Bendel Lab members uh, who helped out really appreciate it. Uh, specifically, Candice, um, who did all of the graphics for everything you saw, all of the promotional materials. If I had done it, it would have looked like a fifth grader was putting on this workshop. So really appreciate uh, that level of polish that was only possible um, because of her. I uh, wanted to also thank Claire, uh, who is the event manager here in LK, who is so flexible. Uh, in responding to all of our last minute requests when we realized there was going to be a lot more people uh, than we had anticipated. Uh, she was really flexible. Um, and to you all for uh, for coming, for being so engaged. Um, we didn't have a single session where there were no questions. It's the worst thing ever for speakers when no one uh, uh, has questions at the end. So it really made our job easy that you all here and also on Zoom uh, were so engaged. So thank you. Uh, and finally, since Mike embarrassed me, I thought I would embarrass him. It's only fair. Uh, he maybe knew this was coming, so he decided to stay home this morning. Um, he uh, was instrumental in help uh, helping to make this happen. And we actually got some very exciting news last night when we were at dinner that uh, he was promoted uh, and got tenure. So really exciting. Uh, this is a picture. Uh, and finally, uh, stay tuned for next year's workshop. Um, we are excited to continue uh, building on the success well, we had here. Um, all the information will show up uh, on the website, which is angelalab.com slash spatial biology workshop. The recordings of the talks will be posted there sometime over the next week. Uh, I'll send out an email once that happens. 
and we'll also be sending out a form uh, to get your feedback. And also, if anyone wants to self-nominate uh, to give a talk next year, we're definitely going to be looking for speakers. Um, so thank you all. Uh, and I hope you all have a safe trip back to uh, wherever uh, your travels may take you. Thanks.